Hello, LOTR SBG team fans and Middle Earth War Gamers. We are here with our uh, next episode of Battle Class uh, Season 1 How a Game Plays Out. And today we will be um, talking over the last uh, phase of each game called the Combat. So, this is the Combat phase, it's the third phase, and it is the last phase for the turn. So, uh, Jason, why don't you uh, start us off? All right, guys. Uh, so, everything we've talked about so far has led up to this. And, you know, it's the last video for what we're doing so far. Um, all we've talked about is setting you up for combat. So we've talked about deployment. We've talked about movement. We've talked about shooting. And now we're talking about the big kahuna itself. So, combats are when you obviously have two models in base contact, and they are going to fight each other. Um, we won't get into the specifics of all that, but... There are a lot of things that happen during the combat phase. You have um, heroic actions. Uh, there are two of them. Heroic movements, heroic... Uh, no, sorry, not heroic movements. Blame the last. Heroic combats and heroic accuracies. Dang it. Not heroic accuracies, heroic strikes. <sighs> See what happens when I go first, guys? I do bad. Anyway, um, so you have those heroics, and then you have stuff you're basically setting yourself up for what you're trying to achieve so for objective based games if you're playing like dan and myself too a lot and sam when you're playing with um shield walls you're setting yourself up to try and hold your opponent at bay and move towards those objectives for killing based scenarios since usually shield walls are a weaker strength we're just trying to slowly whittle down our opponent and you know win through kills through attrition um, so yeah, that, that, that's kind of what the combat phase is for, guys. Uh, Sam, you want to take uh, one specific point and go from there? Yeah, uh, well, first I want to agree with you saying how important the combat phase is. It's, it's definitely where the game-breaking uh, moments happen uh, <clears throat> for either player. Um, uh, it's, well, the close-ups are, it's, uh, like you said, it's what it all comes down to. Um, I, um, let's see. For me, it's, it's, um, it's more of just what I've said before, just, uh, maximizing your odds. You, if if you don't make the right moves, you you will lose. Um, I know that's an that's, that's an oblivious statement, but it 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 comes down to really small moves. Every little small move counts. It, you can't be general with your moves. Um, it's like Jason has said before. It's it's, it's like chess on steroids, and um, you know, just if if a model is just an inch too far to the left, that could cost you the game. I, I've heard plenty of stories where one model, one move, costs someone the game. But uh, that's uh, my first first thoughts, Dan. Or yeah, Dan. Um, yeah, so, uh, let me, uh, go over what I like to normally do with my combat general, just a general synopsis of my combat phase. Um, so, normally I play something what they call the hammer and anvil. So the hammer and anvil, uh, is my, the anvil is my shield wall, uh, which absorbs the fighting. It is the numbers, it is the... Something I throw to um, disrupt my opponent's uh, forces, um, kind of form them up, if you want, into my uh, my world or realm. And then I use my uh, hammer units, uh, my cavalry, um, my um, heroes, who are all mounted generally, to come around and start willing down on my opponents. Um, that is just a general synopsis of my generally um my combat phase um of course um there's a lot of just intricate things you can do to maximize your odds but um 
let's go ahead and let Joe uh, discuss on that or elaborate on that. Okay, so um, yeah, I have a few points. So he was talking about Hammer and Anvil. Um, so like, the strategy battle game has so many different armies now. Um, some armies excel in shooting. Some armies excel in combat. Some armies do both. Not great, but good, good enough to win a game. Um, I would say um, combat heroes are probably the most used hero in the game. Um, for the, I mean, really, ultimately, you're paying. Um, most heroes in the game are combat heroes, better than others. But like heroes like Elisar, heroes like Boromir, heroes like Aemir, heroes like Emerhill, guys that can go in there, they hit hard, and they um, and they decimate troops. <clears throat> now there are some heroes that I like to call anti-hero heroes. These are heroes that can kill heroes really easily. So there are some heroes that I think can kill troops really easily. So um, so knowing like what your hero's strengths are in combat to me is important. So if you have um, four mirror of the White Tower, and he excels in combat at both killing heroes and troops because he has the lance, because he has six might, things like that. Um, so knowing what your heroes can do in combat is pretty good. Um, there are some some situations you'll get into um, where you and your opponent lock lines. I I rarely play shield walls personally. I prefer armies like Rohan or Hobbits. Both of them stylistically are different. Hobbits, you're looking to engage an opponent's shield wall and then envelop them. You flank around them and you try and surround their, their shield wall. Rohan, you charge in, you meet their shield wall, and same same way same thing, just a little different. You envelop, you try and get around, you take away their spear supports. Um But what I was gonna say is, is when you get into combat, you get it, you get your heroes in, you're lined up, the dice are about to start rolling. Um, I personally, we care, we call this the Carolina Crush. Um, you get, it's the play style that we use. I think it's it's pretty common. Is you get all your heroes in combat, and against their shield wall, it's optimal. If your opponent moves first, then you can kind of choose what what you uh, co- uh, get into combat. So, what we like to do is we get all our heroes into combat, and then with my Rohan, I can call death, which I get a free heroic combat with all my heroes. Um, I tend to do this in the first few turns. You can wait to do it, um, but regardless, what what we all do is we call combat, and then our heroes do their fights first because heroic combats go first in sequence. So call heroic combat, then you're hopefully, optimally, your hero will kill the model, and then you can use if they're still on their horse. Uh, last year we talked about getting shot off your horse or something silly happening. So hopefully they're still on their horse so they have the mobility to flink around shield walls and maybe engage other heroes. Alright, um, that'll be my first point. Basically, having good combat heroes and setting yourself up with heroic combats. Thoughts? Yeah, um, so I'm going to go right off of what Joe said, and um, yeah, we do, as we call it, the Carolina Crush. Um, we like to use our heroes to, we we all, we all take big heroes. Sam usually has uh, Thor and uh, Dane. I have uh, Boromir, Imrahil. Dan always has uh, LSR, but we usually have these big thematic heroes that are combat heroes, like you said. And so when we're setting it up, I actually personally like to go first if I can, um, not second, because I can get my, my big heroes against someone small. Like I talked about in the shooting, I send a Boromir against a foot soldier or against an archer or a spear support, and then I can use heroics and slingshot them around. Hey, I sent uh, Emmerhill into my opponent's leader, so it's a one-on-one. Oh, well, now I'm going to use... Uh, Boromir to do a heroic combat off of the one guy and slingshot him around the backside, like I talked about from shooting, slingshot, you know, fight it something really easy and then run around the backside or run around a flank or whatever you need to do and then go support your own heroes to help kill um, what your other heroes are fighting. Be that a opponent's leader, an opponent's big hero, an opponent's monster, um, anything like that. So... You know, you can do something, like I said, there's two combats and strikes. Um, so if you got, like I said, if I have Emmerhill against my opponent's leader, I'm striking up higher, 
and uh, in a perfect world, you're both on on uh, horses. But with Emory having a lance, I have that advantage with the plus one to wound after I've gotten my charge off. So now I go and throw Boromir into that combat as well. Well, now I have more dice than my opponent. So you got to be you got to set it up so that you can your heroes can support each other. And there are armies, and we'll get to this in later episodes. There are armies that aren't as combat friendly. Um, Hobbits is one of those. They don't really like getting into combat, especially against a shield uh, shield wall, because they want to be able to envelop. And if you can build a long shield wall where you've got spears supporting a sword and board in the front, you've got two attacks, and hobbits don't have that ability. So, again, combat also comes down to positioning in the end, setting yourself up so that you can combat. If, if your opponent has a 40-type army, and there's a lot of them that are cheaper now, especially like Umbar, where they've got some really good uh, units, uh, and I'll, I'll let someone else talk about that, but there, there, there's different unit types, too. You've got just regular sword and board heroes. You've got elite unit types. And then you've got your different levels of heroes. You've got good heroes that are combat heroes, like Joe said. And then you've got heroes that are the medium heroes, uh, like Forlong, for example, to me, is a great troop killer. He's got two attack base. He's three wounds. But he's really good at going in there because he's strength five. He's got three points of might. He's defense uh, six, but on the charge, and he's got a war spear, so he's strength five. So against defense seven guys, he's wounding on fives, plus with the war spear on the charge, he's wounding on four. So he's a really good um, elite unit killer, too. He can go in against uh, like defense seven Kaza Guard or defense seven uh, Iron Hills Warriors and really do some damage. Um, so again, you have to, you need to know what your, you need to know your army synergy. I think we've talked about that before as well. You need to know your army synergy and use them to support each other. Don't leave a hero on a flank without any support. Um, but yeah, enough of my rambling for now. Uh, Sam, what you got, man? Uh, I kind of want to veer off what you were saying. Um, I always like to make sure I, I match up as many models against other models as possible. I want to... Uh, make sure I have an appropriate number of dice against the corresponding number of dice. Um, I'm going to use a metaphor. I like metaphors. Um, so you, you have, uh, a, a, say you have one of your heroes. He's got three attack. Uh, he's in an alley, and there's three guys in front of him. Each of them have one attack. You know, that hero has a good chance of taking on all three of those guys and winning. Um, Say the hero's out of the picture. You still have the three guys, and you only have two guys. Um, well, it would be really nice if you had another model in there. But so what you want to do is um, just maximize what you have. Have one guy go against two, and uh, another go against one. Um, so I like to do that across the line. Uh, Provided the circumstances, um, I don't. I don't like to send guys to their deaths unless maybe I'm uh, feeding a hero or a monster. Um, I, I like to maximize my odds, have more dice against my opponent if I can. Uh, one thing I really love to look forward, uh, look look for in a game is it, kind of like a slingshot, but. Um, uh, I guess has a much larger effect. Uh, if, if I can get the opening, I like to take a hero in and then surround that one model with guys and then call for a combat and then send all those guys out to other combats, getting at least two guys on surrounding combats. And I've seen it. It's been very effective and very helpful for me in past games. Uh, uh, that's a big takeaway I've had from all my years of gaming in this game. Um, just maximizing the number of dice. Uh, when if if you have a hero or a, and a, of the opponent surrounded, um, and they have three attack, they only have three dice to roll to get that six to win. Where you could have 
as many as eight or nine models on that hero that you're more than likely going to roll a six on. Now, I know that maybe that's overkill for some people, but I like to, like I said, I like to maximize my odds. Um, Maximus is a fictional supervillain appearing in American comic books published by Marvel Comics. Thanks, Alexa. The character has been depicted by... Um, so, yeah, um, I, I like to, I, I've also said before, I'm a conservative player, so, um, I'm, I'm not a, a huge risk taker, and, uh, when I see opportunities, I, I really like to, uh, I really like to uh, take them and not, make, make sure they're not wasted, that's another thing, you don't want to waste opportunities if you can take it, uh, Look before you actually move. Look at what's on the board, and look at look look a step ahead of what steps you plan to make. What what can the opponent do if you do this? Um, can this model be trapped if I move it there? Uh, can this model uh, disrupt the control zone of this model so I can get this model past it? Uh, it takes a lot of practice, but uh, once you get a feel for uh, the movement rules, you can, well, you can rule the movement face. Uh, thoughts? Yeah, so I have um, quite a few thoughts. Um, so I'd I like to introduce some vocabulary to, uh, to uh, you guys. Um, one of those is something that Sam kind of touched up upon about maximizing your dice. Um, kind of the normally the slang for that is uh, stacking dice. So if there's a fight you really want to win, um, you can stack dice. So uh, here's some ways to stack dice: uh, get the charge off with your hero, trap him with some uh, regular troops, and spear support all the troops. Um, if the hero is not mounted, you could, of course, spear support him as well. And then uh, let's go ahead and throw a uh, banner three inches away, and then you have a load of dice to throw. Um, and they, um, mostly all that means um, they can... Uh, that All those odds, you're pretty much just stacking the dice literally in your favor so that you have a better shot of winning. Um, so next up... I would like to talk about um, a burnout, and this is something that Joe kind of talked about um, with the Carolina Crush, but overall, uh, generally, it's called a burnout. And that is uh, you uh, first turn of combats, you call, if you have the, got the charge off, of course, you can call a boatload of uh, heroic combats with all your heroes and just kill a load of guys. Um, something that um, I've noticed when, when you're playing, if somebody kills enough enough of your models, then you you start to actually feel its effects, not not just in terms of um, analytics, like, hey, I'm close to being broken, but you don't have, you start to not have enough models to position uh, where you need to. You don't have enough model bases to plug holes. You don't have enough bases to stack dice. Um, so those are two, uh, two things that um, I would always recommend doing. Uh, in fights that you really need to win, like against a hero, or if you want to heroic combat off of somebody, stack dice. And if you um, have all your heroes mounted, um, I'd also recommend a burnout. Uh, the 10 inch movement really helps cover the distance for uh, heroic movement. So, um, Joe, uh, thoughts? Yeah, I actually have um, quite a bit. So I'd like to talk first about having a bad combat phase. I think everyone's had a bad combat phase. Um, some armies it affects more than others, like a low model count army. If you have a bad combat phase, you tend to be kind of behind. But so, for instance, let's say I'm playing Rohan, uh, low model count. I charge, get the charges off, which is key. I charge, call the heroic combats with two or three heroes, uh, all the combats fail. Let's say I roll three highest with Amir. He gets uh, pushed back. Uh, they wound his horse. I horse lord it and pass. 
then let's say I have uh, Dernhelm, charge him. She failed the combat. Nothing happens. She backs away. The same. I'm charging a shield wall, which is common. The same. I'm charging an Iron Hill shield wall. Um, charge it. I lose over half the combats, and I lose four models. Doesn't normally happen, but it could. How would I recoup from that? Well, one way to do it, if you're not playing another shield wall, is to leave a reserve in the back. This is kind of popular cavalry. Leave a little bit of reserve in the back so the next turn they can't countercharge you with a heroic combat, or sorry, a heroic movement. Um, but one way to recoup about it is make sure that you are positioned when you do charge, that your heroes can still do work the next turn. So if you fail, your heroes can charge in again, hopefully, and uh, go on off that. I wouldn't be too phased. I mean, you're always going to have a bad turn. Uh, in, in any game, you could have a bad turn. So I wouldn't be too worried about having a bad combat phase. Um, it happens. Uh, I've had some bad combat phases and then gone on to win the game because the other combat phases I had were excellent. So to newer players, anyone who wants to go to a tournament or just free play with your friends, I'd highly recommend not to let a bad combat phase uh, bring you down the dumps. And another point I'm going to bring up is uh, war gear. We haven't touched on it yet. Um, specifically, um, Elven Blades and um, Hand Weapons. So, Elven Blades is a very common thing now in the game. Uh, most big hitters uh, have them, like Aragorn has an Elven Made Weapon. Sorry, it's not an Elven Blade anymore, it's an Elven Made Weapon. Um, basically, Elven Made Weapon is, is if you charge and your fight value is the same, uh, you roll a die. Um, Normally, it's a 1, 2, 3 goes to evil, 4, 5, 6 goes to good. But if you have an Elven Blade, then you win on a 3+, plus instead of a uh, 4+. plus. So it really helps the odds. Um, I'd highly recommend uh, anyone doing that. Um, if you can take an Elven Blade, I would highly recommend it. <laughs> and then I'm going to go into Special Strikes. Um, so... Each uh, unit in the game now in their profile has um, what kind of weapons are in their profile. Uh, so, for instance, Hobbit Militia and Rohan, they have axes. Rohan Riders at least have axes, swords, and um, other kind of uh, war gears like that. So, axes allows you to piercing strike. Uh, piercing strike now gives you plus one to your strength, but you get minus D3 to your defense. Um, I highly recommend piercing striking in um if you're playing an army like Lake Town or Hobbits that are gonna die probably anyway if you lose the fight, then go on piercing strike. But with a model like a Rohan Rider, um that's a little bit more expensive, I would do that sparingly. I would do it in a fight where you're um fighting a lower fight value model and where your um the dice aren't as stacked against you. That but it allows you to kill faster. Um it's a great way to get a strength 5 Rowan Rider, so you can kill defense 5 models on 4s. It's great. Um, another one is Faint, so models of swords can faint. Faint means that um, if if you are the same fight value or higher than your model, uh, your opponent's model, you can do Faint. Faint means that you um, get minus D3 to your, defensive, uh, your fight value, but you um, get to reroll 1s to wound. So when we talk about stacking dice on someone, uh, what I like to do and other people like to do is they like to faint. So then when you roll a wound, you could have some re-rolls to wound, and sometimes you can convert those ones into uh, the wound. Uh, but then there's uh, one called um, Stab. So say you have a um, Warrior of Mysterith, and you're fighting a Knight of Dalimroth. The Knight of Dalimroth has a higher fight, so you have to opt to um, you want to stab. Stab means that if you lose the fight, your model takes a strength to hit, and then your opponent's model can roll to wound. Um, stabbing is something that I would do with a higher defense model. I think it's normally safe to do. Um, I mean, you could do it probably with a Hobbit or a, a Lake Town Warrior, but um, 
yeah, those are just uh, some some things you can do in there in the combat phase to help um, maximize your killing power. Uh, I highly recommend trying it out if uh, if you don't. Um, and then I have one more point I'm going to cover is um, heroes uh, heroic strikes. So heroic strike was a huge uh, innovation in the Hobbit rules, where a model can increase their fight value by D3 or D6. I don't remember. I think it's D6. Um, and in this current edition, models are limited to strikes. So when you're picking your hero, you're making your list. Um, I what I like to do is I like to look for heroes that have strike. I think it's a really important ability to do. Um, so yeah, I'd recommend just strikes. Um, if you're gonna charge a cave troll or uh, charge a big hero with a smaller hero that doesn't have strike, it can normally end up bad for you unless you're just wanting to feed him in there. Um, so that's kind of my thoughts for now. I'll let someone else take the floor. Thoughts? Yeah, I uh, I like what you said, Joe, about having a reserve. That's actually really big, um, especially for a Rohan army. And I'm just starting to get into that. And I'm seeing it in a couple games I've played now that, because I've watched Joe a lot, obviously. And um, you charge in, but you need to have some spare guys. Because there are those turns, especially for me, when you just, you can't roll anything higher than a four. And when that happens, you're just sitting there going, mother, what the heck is going on? Really? Why, Dice? Why now? I mean, it all averages out in the end. But in the moment, you're just sitting there cursing under your breath and muttering, and you're all mad, and your opponent's sitting there going, my bad, bro, what can I do? <laughs> it's just a dice game. Um, but, yeah, having reserves. And, and, and the biggest thing for that is um, making sure that you have those reserves, but they can't get charged by your own. And you can have reserves on foot, too. Um, J Dan and I just played a game recently for um, what was, uh, To the Death, and... I actually just let him fight my front line, and I used all my cab as my reserves. So when a hole opened, I was able to send my cab around the flank and end up using my fight for cab to um, win that flank over and slowly push it in. And it made a, it made a big deal because I, I was able to break Dan's line, and uh, he's probably sitting here cursing at me now. Yeah, I remember that jerk but uh it, it's smart you can you, you don't have to just use infantry or just use cavalry as your reserves you can use a combination of you can even use heroes as reserves for that game is specifics and uh I'll, I'll use it as a transition point army synergy is huge um so again please watch our battle reports if you haven't but if you have you know i like to play emmerhill emmerhill is my guy uh, i just i just like emmerhill and Fiefdoms have got much better with all their little bonuses that they give to each other. And Immerhill is a 12-inch banner for the entire army with the pure bonus. So what I had Immerhill do that entire time was just sit in the back of my lines with a 12-inch banner effect covering my entire covering the entire battlefield for me, pretty much. And not only does he do that, but uh, Warriors of Dolan Rock and Men at Arms get a plus one fight back. So I used my synergy where I had Fight three, Warriors Ministry of the front line. I had fight four, Men at Arms, giving the fight support. Then I had a 12-inch banner for all those Men at Arms. So I technically had three dice in a fight. And then where I had Emmerhill positioned right in the middle of my back line, he was giving a three-inch plus one fight value to all my Men at Arms. So it ended up being that Dan charged in and called a heroic combat against my Warriors Ministry of the Tears. Not realizing I went three deep. I had six dice plus a reroll, and I was actually in fight because he charged in with um, here in the tall, who's fight five. And I had fight five in that fight, and I ended up winning because of that and dehorsing and here in roll to one and went prone. So again, army synergy is big. Um, you need to know your bonuses. So uh, some, I think Dan mentioned a three inch banner. So if you have some guys give a six inch banner, LSR gives a six inch banner. Uh, Bard for Survivor's Lake Town Pure Bonus, I believe, is a 12-inch banner, just like Emmerhill is. You need to make sure that you have those in a position, and again, this all goes to positioning, in a position where you can maximize that. Uh, yeah, Emmerhill is usually my leader, so do I want him front and center so that everybody can charge him? No, but I can mitigate that by putting him in a position where that 12-inch banner can still affect most of, if not all, of my battle line, and then 
use that to your advantage. Um, and uh, my last thing I'm going to talk about before I throw it over to Sam, um, don't get bloodthirsty in combat. And this has come back to bite me in the, the rear end a few times, especially as a new player. You really like going in there and killing things. And there are scenarios for that, to the death, or to battle. Um, I think uh, Ill Met by Moonlight is actually a killing scenario as well. But there's a lot of scenarios that are killing, uh, domination, uh, capture and control. Yeah, you, you gotta you gotta kill your opponent's models to break them and get the game in, but you still have to go and achieve those objectives. I had a game at the last boards of the Potomac where um, I played a very weak defense army. It was only defense four, and I won every single combat. And I was just like, and every time I won, I would kill something. And so by like the third turn of the game, because we were in combats pretty early on, I had broken his arm. Well, unfortunately, it was capturing control. You roll on a one or two to see if the game ends, and he rolled a one and the game ended, and he won the game. I had decimated his army, but the objective of that game was to have the uh, control points. And he had three of them, and I only had two. So he won. So you don't want to get bloodthirsty. There are scenarios um, where something uh, called shielding. Uh, Joe talked about special strikes. This isn't a special strike, but it's actually a very critical part of the game. Shielding is important. Um, and shielding is any model that has a shield, and there are some models that have exceptions to this, and they'll say it in their profile, can shield. What you do is you double your base attacks, and then if you win the fight, you don't strike. Your opponent just backs away, and that combat is over. Well, this could have been really useful for me, and I should have realized it on the second turn after I, I realized too late that he was pretty much, by the time I realized that my opponent was broken, it was too late to do this. But if you don't want the game to end because you're still trying to grab objectives, you can shield in a combat so that you have a chance to win that combat because you're doubling down your base attacks. And then if you win it, your opponent just backs away so there's, you don't kill him, which allows you to go to the next turn. Um, so yeah, shielding is really important. Uh, now you can only do shielding on foot too, so mounted models cannot shield. Uh, and then I'm actually going to lie. I lied. I'm going to do one more point where everybody's talked about stacking dice so far. So here's a good example of how you stack dice. Uh, we'll just go uh, Warrior or Knight of Dolan Rock. Those are my, my, my guys. Knight of Dolan Rock, base attack one. Get the charge off, either by having priority or heroic movements. Charge in. So you get your charge bonus. It's two attacks. Okay? Win the fight. Now, if I have Emerhill nearby, like I talked about, because, again, the, comp, the synergy, I can make him fight five and have a third dice. So I could have three dice in the fight if need be to try and get it to win. Now when I win, I, if my opponent is on foot, I knock him prone. So I double my strikes. So I literally just quadrupled my dice. If you're talking about stacking dice, I have one attack base that doubled on the charge that now doubles again when I knock my opponent prone. So that's another way that you can stack your dice. And I've done that multitudes of times, just one guy, even charging into two guys, and you stack all these dice, and it can be really, really powerful. Um, so that's everything I got. Uh, we're actually going to jump over to Dan. So take it away, Dan. All right, so um, here's a couple of interesting thoughts. So what's the overall goal for a combat phase? I think the overall goal is to kill more, generally to kill more models than your opponent. Um, so we've talked about stacking dice. We've talked about burnouts. Uh, one thing to think about, though, is um, during you know during the movement phase, you're moving your army into position for combats. Um, when um, you get into combats, um, you sometimes, uh, if you have uh, priority, you pick what combat goes first. So uh, generally, sometimes um, some people are like, okay, well, let's go from left to right, and they start going and they uh, realize, hey, some of my guys are trapped, and uh, I'm, they're, my opponents are winning and rolling double the attacks. Uh, trap mall means uh, if you uh, lose the fight, uh, you do not, and, and you cannot back away because uh, of whatever whatever reason, your guy cannot back away an inch, um, then you get to roll double your dice against uh, your opponent. So one thing to think about is if you have priority, and you're picking the fights, take a look uh, over the combats before you start calling them to see 
what combats uh, would actually um, better you to call first. So uh, that's uh, my first point. My second point is this. Um, sometimes uh, when you start getting in combats, especially this is just for me, and I'm like, hey, I just need to keep doing heroic combats and break my opponent. Sometimes doing no heroic actions in a uh, um, combat phase is, is totally cool. I mean, uh, you do your your uh, initial big uh, heroic um, burnout, and then you have you've killed enough models where you can uh, preserve your might for other things. And uh, if it's like an objective based scenario, um, you can maybe do uh, another heroic combat towards uh, one of the objectives, uh, which is something I've done before. Um, but yeah, it's, it's important to, uh, also engage your, uh, opponents, um, in a location, this kind of falls back into movement, but it also is relevant to combats. It's important to engage, uh, your opponents, um, in a place that really, uh, helps your army. Uh, me and Jason both play shield wall, so does Sam. Um, so we, we're fine with fighting in a fairly, um, I wouldn't say open field, but uh, a kind of more compact field, and we just we just need some movement to move our heroes around. Um, that would not help Joe out at all, because he he plays Rohan a lot, and he needs to have uh, some move movement to envelop. So um, one thing to think about, and this, this is going back to movement a little bit, um, but also is going into the combats, is you got to think about where to engage, um, where can I get the most base bases in against my opponent? Um, like somebody like Derek, who used to play Herod, and I think he only took a couple of spears in his army. He relied a lot on enveloping and encircling his opponents and stacking dice that way because his watcher used to have two attacks. Um, he would always engage in a more open field. So um, let's go ahead and go over to Sam. <laughs> So, um, as someone who takes a shield wall in pretty much every game, I've become really familiar with Sorcerer's Blast and Hurl. Um, so, what what happens, and it's a very good tactic on uh, the, the opponent's part. Uh, it, it actually took me a while to get into the habit of getting uh, prepared for it properly. Um, but what normally happens is they'll they'll take the wizard up to the edge of the line or a monster to the edge of the line, and they'll just grab a guy and hurl him straight down the line, knocking out as many guys as they can. And it just ruins combat for that entire turn because I, I, I'm not able to fight back at all because all my guys are on the ground. So... Um, be aware of that, especially if you have mounted heroes, because that's just waiting to get knocked off your uh, mount really quickly. Uh, I, I say either have your heroes in on the monster or wizard if you can, uh, or at a safe distance from said monster or wizard. Um, as for your line, uh, it's, it's kind of hard, because sometimes the enemy will have a line as well as a monster or a wizard. Um, so you want to maintain keeping a line against them, but at the same time kind of spread out your line. Uh, so should a monster or a wizard, you know, throw a guy into some more guys, they're not knocking out your whole line. Um, thoughts? Yeah, a few. Um, you touched on the hurl. I was going to get into a brutal, uh, mount. So, um, monsters are one of those wild cards to me. Uh, whenever I seem to use them, they never uh, do what they're supposed to. And I've had games where I verse people, and their monsters do exactly what they're supposed to. Um, granted, I, models like Bayorn or um, Birders, like hero monsters, tend to be a little bit better because they have might, and they can uh, manipulate dice rolls and stuff with their might. But, um... Brutal Power Attack is one of those things that scares me. Uh, Hurl, in particular, with both armies I main, uh, with the Shire and Rohan, uh, getting my Rohan line hurled would be absolutely devastating, and a single Hurl can devastate Hobbits as well. Um, but uh, other Brutal Power Attacks, like um, Barge, 
is similar to it's similar to heroic combat where you can um, fight the model, uh, win the fight, and then you can barge d six inches, maybe d three now. I don't remember exactly, but um, yeah, d three. So that's something also if you're reversing a monster to be aware of where your heroes are positioned or where your um, banner is positioned or something like that. Because if someone's smart, they'll get the um, they'll get the troll or fell beast or whoever in next to a key target, win the fight, barge into them, and then an, the, another brutal power attack that is worth mentioning is um, I think the only other brutal power attack other than the special hero ones is um, rend, and when you rend, you attack your opponent's strength value, not their defense value. Um, and monsters tend to be pretty, um, they tend to be pretty popular. Uh, a lot of armies tend to have a troll, or some, some good armies have ants, uh, eagles, uh, bayorn, things like that. So something to be uh, aware of when you're, do, uh, actually, when you're picking your fights. Uh, I like to do monster fights last, because they can manipulate, um, well, they, 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 they won't be able to hurl and screw you that combat phase. Uh, so if you have priority, I'd normally save that one for last, a monster one. Um, and then I got one more point I'm going to touch on that I don't think anyone else has is uh, warriors with um, two attack. Uh, a lot of evil armies tend to have two attack warriors, like berserkers, ferals, washers of karna. Um, Dan touched on it. I was thinking it's um, it's uh, pretty good because you can use. It, it goes back to the stacking of dice. So normally you got a shield wall. Uh, you engage and you fan out with your heroes on mounts, and I like to use my two. I tend to place play ferals, and berserkers, and you wrap around. And you start taking off spear supports. Honestly, uh, I wouldn't be scared to send two or three berserkers into a hero and uh, go to town on them. Um, but yeah, I'd recommend if you're building an army. Uh, especially an evil army tends to be more popular. Is looking for those two attack models. They tend to be more expensive uh, than a, a regular generic warrior. So I would recommend maybe taking uh, not as many. But in the combat phase, they can actually change. Uh, they tend to be gun flanks. So if uh, someone has a shield wall, you go around on a flank with them. Uh, that's something that I'd look at. And uh, uh, I actually love using two attack models. Because they're always going to have to attack too, so which is good. Um, thoughts? Yes, I, I agree with I agree with Joe a lot there. Um, and th this will be one of my points. Uh, we'll cover this in a later season, I think. But building an army, and when you build your army, you have to look at that. So you have a number of different types of troops. You have, you know, just regular, like I said, so I think I've mentioned this already, sword and board troops. Then you have elite troops. So guys with two attacks, like berserkers. Or for me, because I like to play uh, Durin's folk with uh, Durin himself. Um, Iron Guard have two attacks, so those would be considered elite troops. They're just regular, you know, sold regular warriors. But since they have, they have something extra, so they're considered to be elite. Like I talked about, a uh, Kazakh Guard are considered to be elite because they're defense seven guys. And if you take them with Durin, you can point them up another point or two. And they actually get some special abilities like Burley, and they come with a two-handed axe. So then you're doing plus one to wounds without any negative effects, which is something a two-handed axe does. If you go two-handed with it, you take a minus one to your dual roll. So um, getting when you're charging in, if you can do something, and Joe used to do it with his Urukai, he would put his berserkers on the front line, so he's got two attacks, and he pike support them with an Urukai warrior with a pike. So now he's got three dice right there in a combat, and if he's got a banner nearby, he's actually got a fourth if he need be to re-roll one to try and win. So um, Durin's folk play a little different. I'm not going to go really into it, but they don't have spear support. So when you're setting yourself up in the movement phase, if movement sets up combats like I opened with, you want to get those elites in there, but you don't want to lead them on their own. I actually kind of like to put my elites on a flank, or two even, and use um, other just regular warriors to support them. A, a dwarf warrior with a shield supporting a uh, iron guard, you've got three attacks in there now. And you can actually set yourself up so that you can trap, as Dan was saying, to double those dice down. So you can stack those dice. 
Ooh, pardon me, I burbled. <laughs> um, so you get those guys on the edge. You can get the edge trapped. And then, again, I agree with what Dan was saying. You want to pick the fights that are, if you have the priority, you want to pick the fights that are going to benefit you greatly. If your banner is in combat and you actually have a banner, you're not going to do that combat first because you want to do all the other combats that can the banner can affect first. And if that banner is in combat, again, positioning, positioning sets up combats, movement sets up combats, you should have your banner in base contact some, with someone. So if it does die in that last combat, you can handle it. Um, and I agree with what Joe said. You have to be very careful. Monsters are coming more along with siege weapons like we talked about in the shooting video. Um, you're starting to see those. So you need to know how to combat them. And that goes with something like I talked about, slingshotting earlier on. You can slingshot a hero off a of combat and into a monster. Um, you can send a hero against one to begin with, use a strike, and then use another hero and slingshot him in there to stack more dice. Uh, or you can feed the hero, feed the monster, which is something I'll usually do myself. I'll charge the monster, but set him up at an angle so that if my opponent does win the fight, which he's most likely fighting just one single warrior, he can't hurl him into something that's going to hurt me. So uh, combats, you got to pick and choose where you set yourself up for. And yeah, um, I think that's about everything I have so far. Uh, oh, um, one last thing. Uh, like we're talking about for traps, for moving away, you don't have to move directly backwards. You just need to be able to move an inch in any direction. Uh, that's what we were talking about, trapping guys. So if your opponent has trapped you, and this is something Dan and I know very well, especially with shield walls, if you have a guy and they're side by side and one guy dies, and especially for me because I go three deep usually sometimes with my pikemen, well, I can only move one guy. Well, if I have the guy on the left of my guy on the right dies, I can then move my guy left one full inch because he can take the place of the guy that died. Um, and then you've therefore not be trapped. So that is another way. You, you got to think smart. When how, how, how can I back away? And like Joe said, you can have those combat, those combat phases where everything goes against you. Um, yep, I think I'm good there. Uh, I believe Joe has something. So, Joe, I'll turn it over to you. Or no, uh, sorry, Dan. Dan has something. Dan, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to... Um go back to uh, something that was said earlier. Um, um, yeah, pretty much I, I just agree with everyone, anyone, uh, everything everyone said um, there. Um, but something I want to elaborate on is um, when you're doing uh, combats, um, sometimes you don't want to have all your guys in combat. Um, like, there are people like Galadriel who are unarmed, so they take a penalty for combats. Um, but you do want them uh semi close by so they can use magic um to help um another thing uh that you do want close by is a banner um sometimes you can give a banner a spear so having him in the back rank um with a spear support is good he does take a penalty um but you don't want him in base contact because if he dies then that's a 25 point investment you just lost um so how do you how do you protect things like that well there's a, there's a tactic called bubble wrapping, and that's where you take somebody who you want to protect or um, somebody who you want to uh, kill, and you just throw a bunch of uh, models um, around them and hope that they don't all die, and that's, that's called bubble wrapping. So no, normally you want to bubble wrap your important models. Uh, I do bubble wrap my hero sometimes so that um, they can get countercharged. Um, or they um, can get pulled off of a combat. So I like to take models and just bubble wrap my hero's bases. And um, that's just something that you uh, can always think about. Um, thoughts? Yeah, I have one last point. And this is, you know, you guys have covered um, a lot of things. But uh, actually sacrificing troops. Uh, and I actually think there is a, play, a time and place to do this. Um one of them is feeding heroes and feeding monsters with a single warrior. You probably know that that, that warrior is going to die uh, unless you get really lucky. 
Um, but it's a sacrifice worth doing because you cancel what their big piece is going to do and helps enable your big piece of what it's going to do. But then uh, there's another situation, and I'll go into uh, my last game I had at Philly. Um, I was racing Rohan with my uh, Thrain Duels Halls um, Iron Hills Alliance, and I knew what he wanted to do because I play Rohan, and he played you know exactly how I would have done it. He charged my shield wall. I put my shield wall in a wedge so he couldn't envelop me. And basically, he had one row of guys fighting, like one, you know, lane of guys fighting. Um, and I was like, okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let him do what he wants to my shield wall. And I'm just going to use my heroes to fan out and kill things. Because it's Lords of Battle. Um, so basically what I did is I sacrificed my shield wall. Because I figured it would hold up long enough to let my heroes go out and do their thing. And it did. Um, um, basically... Uh, I had a fight five sphere support because uh, I had elves supporting dwarves. So I was tying his heroes, uh, making him use his might points for um, strikes and things instead of using might to do combats. Um, so I do think that sacrificing troops is um, is uh, a tactic that you could do. Uh, sometimes you're forced to do it. Sometimes, sometimes you have to do it to progress to the objective or whatever but that's that's my last point guys thoughts yeah so i had just uh one more thought here um so sometimes um a game like a game will end uh randomly at times if um your opponent is broken um so sometimes you actually don't want to be in combat but unfortunately you're in in combat you know, you're just there's no way to get around being based up against uh, your opponents. And uh, furthermore, sometimes the game will end if your opponent's quartered, and there might be some objectives you have not yet accomplished. Um, so here's a little technique that we've developed. Um, so generally, if you do not want to kill your opponent, you're going to shield, if you can, in all of your combats. Um, you just shield, shield away and hope that you don't, you're not going to kill anybody because you don't strike blows if you're shielding. And that's a way to kind of prolong um, the game, so to speak, so you can finish accomplishing your objectives without quartering, quartering your opponent. So that's another, uh, I guess, uh, perk to having shields, is you can shield and prolong the game. Um, but let's say that your opponent is doing that against you, uh, and they have a higher fight, then you can do something. Uh, then you can do the, um, uh, not faint, uh, the stab. And uh, if you stab... Then um, you're uh, take us and you lose the fight. You take a strength to hit, and so you actually have a chance at killing yourself. Um, both Jason and I have done that before. Uh, we wanted to uh, get um, down to a quarter, and so we started stabbing to uh, kill ourselves to end the game. Um, so that's something to uh, look for, um, and ways to kind of uh, use the combat phase and certain um special strikes to uh help um with the uh prolong the game uh thoughts all right guys well i think we're going to end it here uh stay tuned for our uh next episode please like share subscribe and comment below and um rainier and derek should be towards the end of the video Take care and enjoy your Middle-Earth hobby.